Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is a special bonus series entitled, Why Is the Whole World Against Us? The purpose of this series is to offer a deeper spiritual insight into the current war that Israel is raging against Hamas in Gaza, as well as the geopolitical war Jews all around the world are raging in defense of our right to the land of Israel as our homeland and against worldwide anti-Semitism, which has risen exponentially in the aftermath of the October 7th massacre. The teachings I'll be relating are based on a sicha by, given by the Lubavitcher Rebbe in the year Tavshin Chavvav, or in the Hebrew year of 5726, or the English year of 1965. And the sicha is on Parshas Bereshis, based on the first Rashi in Parshas Bereshis. I studied and recorded this material in the merit of a swift victory of the IDF and the protection of all of our fellow soldiers and all Jewish lives within the land of Israel and throughout the world, as well as for the speedy return of our hostages. May it happen very, very soon. So in today's episode, we're going to get into the crux, in my opinion, of the Sicha and the part of the Sicha that for me personally, what I found to be really mind-blowing in terms of its relevance to the current situation that we find ourselves in uh, with trying to defend the right of Israel to exist, with trying to defend our right to the land of Israel, and in terms of really bringing a deeper insight into what's actually going on with this accusation against us of occupiers, of robbers of the land of Israel. Where is this coming from? What's this all about? So this is gonna be the topic that we're gonna be dr- addressing in today's episode. Because today, we're going to take a deeper look at the actual accusation that the nations have against us. So if you've been following along this series so far, you'll know that our launching off point was the very first Rashi found in the book of Bereshis, the very first Safer of the Torah, the book, first book of the Torah, in which Rashi asked the question, why does the Torah begin with the story of creation instead of beginning with the, with the blessing of the new month, which was the first uh, commandment that was given to the Jewish people as a nation. And then Rashi answers his own question by saying that the reason for this, that the Torah began this way, is for the sake of the fact that if the nations of the world come to us at some point, as we see that they are doing now in our times, and accuse us of being robbers uh, for stealing the land of the seven nations, we should reply to them and we should say that the whole world belongs to God. He created it and he thus has the right to give it to whom he deemed proper. With his will, he gave it to them, meaning to the non-Jewish nations. With his will, he took it from them and gave it to us. So as we've been discussing, the Rebbe ha- broke this Rashi down into a bunch of parts and has been asking questions about all of these different parts. And we went through the questions so far and we're actually getting into the answers now. So. Uh, So again, just to further reiterate, um, the four parts of Rashi that we've been exploring is Rashi's question about why the Torah began the way that it did, Rashi's answer about in terms of that there will come a time that the nations of the world will accuse us of robbery, and this is the answer that uh, that we should give to them. And then further embedded within that answer, we have uh, the accusation of the nations, and then we have our answer to the nations. So, so far in yesterday's episode, we addressed the answers to the Rebbe's questions on Rashi's initial question. So please go back and listen to that if you haven't already to bring you up to speed. And today we're 
going to move on and we're going to talk about the answers to the Rebbe's question on the accusation of the nations that's brought down by Rashi. So again, this is a, a pretty technical sicha, so I highly encourage you to follow along with the written document, which I've written up that, that accompanies this audio, if you can, or at least take notes somehow, if you can, because it's, it's a lot to keep track of in terms of the questions and the answers and what Rashi says, what the Rebbe says, and all of that kind of stuff. Nevertheless, I really am trying to the best of my, of my ability to tr- really stay focused on each part on, on one particular part of the Sicha in every episode. So again, today's episode is really going to be focusing on this accusation of the nations. We're going to reiterate the questions that the Rebbe had about the accusation of the nations, and then we're going to give the Rebbe's answer to these questions. Just a small note, you might have noticed, this is something I kind of noticed in learning the Sicha, that uh, even though the order by which we gave the questions was we had questions on Rashi's question, then we had questions on Rashi's answer, then we had questions on the accusation of the nations, and then we had the questions on the our answer, our reply to the nations. Um, when it comes to the answers, we actually skip um, the, the answers to the questions that we had on Rashi's answer, and we're going to actually bring that up at the very end of the Sicha and kind of pull it all together. So uh, my understanding of this is that in order to really understand, have a full grasp and understanding as to why Rashi gave the answer that he did, namely that the reason that the Torah began with the story of Bereshi is in order to give us a uh, what to answer to the nations of the world who accuse us of being robbers for stealing the land of Israel. Um, So in order to understand why this is Rashi's answer to his own question, we really have to delve into this accusation of the nations and we have to delve into our subsequent reply to the accusation of the nations. And in order to understand why Rashi really feels that this whole accusation and answer suffices as an answer to his own question about the Torah beginning this way. So for today, once again, we're really going to be focusing on this accusation of the nations that that Rashi brings up, which once again, just to point out, I think it's really fascinating that Rashi is writing this over um, 900 years ago. And to add a, a, a little bit more interesting context to all of this, Rashi is Rashi's time when Rashi is writing this is in the early 11th century, which was also the beginning of the Crusades when Christians were trying to conquer the land of Israel, which at that time was under Muslim rulership. So it's interesting at that time that 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 uh, Israel, the land of Israel, was really not under Jewish control during Rashi's time, and it's really only now, you know, many many years later, again almost a thousand years later, that this whole conversation, this whole accusation against us of being robbers, of being occupiers of the land, really came to fruition. So I think that's really fascinating in its own right. Uh, So to get back to our Sicha, so let's reiterate the accusation of the nations as well as the questions that the Rebbe has on this accusation of the nation. So the so the accusation of the nations to the Jews is that they accuse us of being robbers for conquering the land of Israel. And the Rebbe had two questions on this accusation. He said, first of all, didn't they steal the land from us? So we spoke about the fact that, you know, from a biblical perspective, which is really from our focus of what we're focusing on here, after the flood, you know, with the story with Noah's Ark and the flood and all of that. So after the flood, Noah and uh, divided up the whole entire world amongst his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the land, which later become known, became known as the land of Israel, was given to his son Shem for for this for Shem and his future descendants, which is where the Jewish people come from, for them to have ownership over this land. So this means really that we as Jews, our descendants, were the indigenous people. We were the original owners of this land. So. If anything, you know, then we see that throughout the years, the land, that land of Israel uh, was actually not known as the land of Israel for many years. For many years, it was known as Canaan, as the Canaanite, the land of the Canaanites, the land of the seven nations is how the Torah refers to it, because there were seven different nations that uh, occupied that land. So if anything, they were occupying our land. They stole it from us. So it wasn't the other way around. So this is the Rebbe's first question is, is, you know, they have the audacity to call us occupiers, us robbers of the land. They're the ones that took it from us. 
But now the second question that the Rebbe has is that, okay, let's say, you know, I took it from you, you took it from me, whatever, this whole conversation aside, um, who says, since when is war con- conquest considered robbery? It, aside from the fact that throughout the world, in people in all cultures, war conquest is a part of every single culture's history, pretty much throughout the entire universe. And this is how countries come to be throughout our history. We see that even in the Torah, according to the Torah's own guidelines, we know that uh, the Everybody in the world needs to abide by the seven laws of Noah, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. So even non-Jews have to keep the Torah in that sense. They have to keep the the seven laws of Noah are binding to them. And one of the seven laws of Noah is indeed the prohibition against stealing. However, we find that never in the Torah was any nation ever punished for stealing another person's land through conquering that land. In fact, there were times when God actually commanded us to conquer land, commanded Yoshua to conquer land, which means which means to say, it just it shows that conquering land is not considered to be uh, stealing. It's a, it's it's not the same thing. So what's this accusation that they have against us of being robbers? So again, number one, uh, if anything, they stole the land from us, and two. Even if you want to say that, okay, now they were focusing on the fact that Yoshua came and conquered the land, or now, you know, we're coming and conquering that land. Like, even if you want to say that that's what's going on here and they're upset about that, they're upset that we're stealing it from them, even though they took it originally from us, um, war conquest is not considered robbery, generally speaking. So what's the deal? Where is this accusation coming from? So this is where the Rebbe gets into the answer. And again, this sort of is like the highlight of the entire Sicha right here. What is it? Is that the Rebbe says that while yes, it's true that conquering land through warfare is not generally considered to be stealing. However, the way that the Jews conquered this land of Israel, meaning this is talking about back in the times of Yoshua when he began this conquest of the land of Israel, um, is very deep is very different than a regular type of conquering of the land. When we as Jews under Yeshua conquered the land of Israel, the conquering that we did was a much deeper type of conquest than a usual transfer of ownership. What do we mean by this? So generally speaking, when we talk about transfer of ownership of an item, whether we're talking about a purchase, whether we're talking about a gift, or whether we're talking about a war conquest, the objects being transferred undergoes an external transition from one owner to another. However, it doesn't essentially change. So it's like, let's say I own a plot of land and maybe I build a house on it, you know, and I live there for many years. And then there comes a point where I decide I want to move and I want to move somewhere else. So I sell my plot of land to somebody else. Okay, great. So they take the plot of land and maybe they keep my house there. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do something else with it. But essentially, it's the same plot of land. Maybe time goes by and this person that bought the plot of land for me uh, gets really old. And then they decide to give this plot of land to their children. So the children have this plot of nan- land now. They they live with this plot of land. Okay, great. They really enjoy it. Maybe they build another house on that plot of land. It's still essentially the same plot of land. The difference is that it belonged to different people throughout the generations, um, but it's always the same plot of land. And then maybe someday, let's say there was like some kind of war. And as a result of the war, there's like a rezoning going on. And maybe, unfortunately, these people are no longer able to live in their home anymore, or maybe they can live in their home, but now it's going to be called a different country. Maybe the area that they live in used to be called Poland. Now it's called Russia because the Russians took over. In fact, something that only came to my attention pretty recently is that quite a number of Arab countries actually only became independent countries during or after World War II. Before that, they were all considered under the Ottoman Empire. They were all just in one conglomerate thing, namely Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Libya, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Iraq, Somalia, Algeria, and the United Arab Emirates. All of these were not their own independent entities until um, until during or after, after World War II. So we see this throughout our history. It's not something unique to nowadays. Throughout 
the history of of mankind, uh, countries change. They change ownership. They change borders and all kinds of things like that. What doesn't change, however, is the land itself. Yes, you know, houses, different homes could be built, different buildings can be built, different infrastructure, different agriculture, but it's basically the same land. However, when it comes to the land of Israel and the Jewish people and the way that the Jews conquered the land of Israel, there's something else going on. So when Jews conquered the land of the seven nations, as it called, it actually affected a change in the essence of the land itself. So where, whereby this land, which we now know as the land of Israel, started out being a land just like any other land, once the Jews took ownership of it through conquering, it became known as the land of Israel. It took on a new name and not just a superficial name, not just like Ottoman Empire versus Morocco or something like that, but it became a Jewish land through and through. The actual essence of the land became Jewish in an, an eternal way, such that it can never be conquered by another nation ever again. It can never be taken away from the Jews. Yes, we've been exiled from our land uh, and have lived in many different places since then. It's not, it has not been under Jewish rulership all of these years since Joshua began the conquering of the land of Israel, which he never finished, by the way. Um, however, even when we were exiled from our land, notice we always refer to it as our land. We always talk about it in our prayers. We talk about how we were exiled from our land when we were distanced from our ground. We always refer to it as our land. It's, a, it's the Jewish homeland. And in spite of the fact that, yes, there are a lot of arguments against this point out there in the world, at the end of the day, the nations of the world sense it. Like really bottom line, like people know that there's a really strong connection of, to, of Jews to the land of Israel. And there's something essential, essentially there. So with all of this in mind, now we can get back to this accusation of the nations and understand why they call us robbers. And we can see that actually, in a certain sense, there's something to what they're saying, believe it or not. Not really, as we'll come to see, we're not actually robbers, as, as we will discuss and we'll talk about why. But nevertheless, we can kind of understand where they're coming from, because the truth is when we conquered the land of Israel, it was not a regular conquest, the way other nations conquer other nations lands in the world. We conquered the land in a different way. We conquered the land in such a way that now it became the land of Israel eternally, meaning to say that even in potential, it can never belong to anybody else. So, uh, and the nations sense this on some level, whether they're conscious of it, whether they're not conscious of it, there, there is a sense uh, that there is something different going on in terms of our connection to the land of Israel and in terms of what we did to it when we conquered this land. So it's not so much that they're upset on some, even though maybe consciously this is what they're saying, that they're saying, we want this land, give it to us, you know, that kind of thing. It's not even so much that they want the land so badly, so much as like they want the land, they're upset that that we changed, we, we, we kind of didn't play by the rules. Like there's sort of, in general war conquest, there's this idea, once again, of, you know, I steal this land, you steal that land, this year it's yours, th that year it's mine. Uh, right now it's under the Greek empire, now it's under the Roman empire. You know, we see this throughout history that it changes ownership all the time. But what, we, what the Jews did to the land of Israel is they changed it in such a way that it can never again, even potentially speaking, belong to anybody else. So this is their accusation. So, so uh, to sum this up, to again, go back to the questions that the Rebbe had about the accusation of the nations and to answer them, so the, so the first question was, didn't the nations of the world steal it from us? You know, we were the original indigenous people. We, the, it was in our portion first, and then they came and stole it from us. So the answer to that, interestingly enough, is no. Why? Because war conquest is not considered robbery. So yes, they conquered it from us. Yes, it went under many different owners before we conquered it. But nevertheless, all of that um, conquering was not considered robbery. So yes, it made our history a little bit more complicated uh, that before we actually went and conquered the land of Israel properly, um, we didn't actually just have it, even though it was initially given to us through Shem. But we cannot say that this was robbery. So no, the eight nations of the world did not steal it from us. They conquered it, 
but they didn't steal it because war conquest is not robbery. And then the second question of, okay, if this is true, if war conquest is not robbery, so why are they accusing us of the same thing? Why are they saying that we're robbers if all we did was conquer the land? And as we now have come to understand is that this is because the way that the Jews conquered the land of Israel, the way that we conquered it is different. It's, a, it's in a more permanent manner and in a more essential way than regular conquest in the sense that we essentially changed the nature of the land such that it can never again belong to you anybody else. So even though subsequently after we conquered the land, other people did conquer it and we were put into exile, nevertheless, the essential connection that we had and that we still have to this land always remains throughout our history and it's still there now. And that's what people are picking up on. And that's what they're upset about is how dare you change the rules of war? How dare you take a land which, uh, which usually land goes under many different owners throughout history. It's conquered by different people, but you come and you change it forever so that it can never again be truly conquered by anybody else. So that's, that's the accusation against us. So that's it for today. And, uh, we're going to kind of, once again, leave you hanging here. Uh, next episode, we're going to get into the answer to the nations. And we're going to get into uh, the questions that, that the Rebbe had on Rashi's answer to the nations. And again, give us a deeper appreciation of this. Because with this in mind, you, you might be thinking to yourself, like, okay, so that means that they do have a point. So um, so how do we deal with this? Did we actually steal the land of Israel from them? Did And if so, are we supposed to be held accountable? Like, what is this all about? So stay tuned to get a deeper insight into all of this through further exploring uh, what our answer to the nations should be. So stay tuned and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzchak ben Benyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, Please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.